OK, so let's take a detour, go over the slides that uh, Jason went through uh, a few days ago. So the way that Gen5 works is that there's a global event queue. The, the event queue is a priority queue. Events are ordered based on the time that they are supposed to occur. The first event is popped off the queue. It gets executed. It may or may not generate uh, other events in the event queue. The events that are generated are inserted in the priority queue. So again, it's not necessarily uh, that the event is appended to the back of the queue. It might be inserted in the middle. It's a priority queue. Um, again, the, if the, the event has take 10 can generate multiple events, one event, no event, events of different types itself. So it's very, very, very flexible. And basically, some objects are there for you to be able to talk to the simulator to uh, schedule events, make things happen in the future. Right? That's how I think about them. And like, an example of this is uh, your CPU tries to fetch an instruction. Uh, that results in sending a request to the iCache later on in the future to, to simulate the um, the fetch latency, and then to simulate the L1 tag latency, the, the event to handle a miss in the L1 is scheduled, if it's a miss. And then there's a latency to DRAM. You start enqueuing uh, events by, uh, based on latencies. Then uh, these function calls end up getting to a point where you don't miss. You find the data that you're looking for, and then events are scheduled to get the data back to the requester. So, and again, time needs a unit. In Gen 5, the unit of time is tick. So you cannot have anything or any time that is smaller than one tick. So it's like a quantum of time. Everything is described as number of ticks. Clock cycle periods, all of them are described as ticks. The global time is also described as number of ticks. By default, number of ticks per second are 10 to the 12, or otherwise said, one tick is one picosecond. So this is how I think about event-driven simulation, is that the user tells, like, makes something happen in the future, and then the simulation reacts to uh, that thing occurring. Right. So for user to have control over things that are happening, the user just specifies a callback function, like you're telling the simulator to call me back when you get to a certain point. And then that function simulates the functionality that you expect it to. So this is, again, like a pseudocode. So if you had event A, then event has a callback function. When the simulator gets um, to time that is equivalent for the time that A is scheduled, it'll call a.callback, a.callback gets the current simulator time and schedules event B in 10,000 units of time into the future. Is it clear to everyone like what this badly written pseudocode means? Cool, thank you. Um, again, the way that I think about it is simulator needs to offer two things. A notion of time, which Gen5 offers as ticks, and an interface to schedule and process events, which are called events in Gem5. And if you go and look at the sim object class, uh, you, you see that it inherits from a class called event manager. So basically, a sim object can talk to the simulator and say, make this event happen at this time. Um, again, uh, going through the details of the fetching an instruction example, um, if you go to the definition of the class event in Gen5, which is defined under source sim eventq.hh, there will be a definition to a pure virtual function. So there's a pure virtual function which makes the event class an abstract class that is called process. So this is the function where you define the functionality that is supposed to happen when you're uh, dequeuing that event in Gen5. An example of this would be uh, like fetch. 
And this is, again, hypothetical code. This is not at all what happens in Gem 5. I mean, it's a little similar to what happens to Gem 5. I mean, in Gem 5, uh, there are a lot more things that happen. So there is a class called fetch event that inherits from event. Then like it has a pointer to CPU. And the process function here is defined as like owner arrow process fetch. So we're basically telling Gem5 whenever an instance of fetch event happens, go find the CPU object that, it, that is its owner and call process fetch from that object, right? I want you all to note that there might be more than one CPU object, right? Like, if you have a two-core system, then there are two CPUs, each of which will have like one object of fetch event, and every time, like, the specific fetch event object is processed, the specific process processor is called to process the fetch. Sorry for the very wordy explanation. Um, but let's look at more practical things. So I use events using this class called event function wrapper. So event function wrapper basically, as its name suggests, wraps an event and a function so that you can initialize it, giving it a, a callable object. And like it sets that callable object to be the callback function for that event. So this way, I don't have to inherit from event and write my own class. I just specify what function needs to be called when this object of event function wrapper uh, is dequeued. And you, have, you note that the prototype for that function has to be void void. So it returns a void. It takes void. So if you are going to use event function wrapper. An alternative to this is extending event on your own, making it possible to have that callable object take arguments as well. Uh, you might remember that I mentioned we look at the details of m5.simulate, and this is the time we look into it. So again, this is defined in source Python m5 slash simulate. Um, again, it's lengthier than what is here, but if you look at it, um, at some point, it'll check a global variable called need startup. And if need startup is um, true, it is going to go through all the sim objects and call that specific function with a specific name called startup. So if you go look at the, the header for the class sim object in source sim, sim object.hh, there will be a virtual function called, that returns nothing called startup. So this is another like initiation init initialization step. This is where you start like scheduling the events that should happen first. Example of it is like scheduling a fetch event for the CPU. Like when you turn on the pros like your computer, your the first thing that happens is that your processor starts fetching. Right? This is kind of equivalent to that. Like off of a cold start, what do you do? Like this is why you would what you would put in the startup. So for example, if we're writing like a traffic generator, like the startup uh, function would maybe schedule an event that'll create a memory request. Any questions so far? So we're going to use the startup function in this step. Um, we're going to see how it's going to be used. OK. So, OK, uh, so this is confusing, but uh, let's go ahead and start declaring an event for our hello sim object. So again, what I'm going to do is Go to source bootcamp. <laughs> bootcamp. Hello, some object.hh. Again, so 
Let's cheat a little bit and copy and paste the whole thing so we don't make any mistakes. So what I'm doing right now is copy and paste the whole code block in slide 19 from slide deck 3. So that'll be event-driven simulation, something in that direction. Oh, the preview is broken. So copy and paste the whole code block and overwrite everything that is in hello some object that HH. OK. So I'm going to wait for you all to do it. Seems like everybody has done it. OK, so let's try to see what has changed from the last time uh, that we looked at this file. So again, the include guards were there before. The parameter uh, inclusion was there. Then including sim object was there. The new include statement that we have added is including sim slash eventq.hh. So the other thing that we have done is declare two things. So an object of event function wrapper that we talked about a little bit before. Um, we're going to name that object of event function wrapper next hello event. And we have also defined, or sorry, declared a function that returns void and takes void so that we can do something with it. Coincidence? I say not. So uh, let's take a look at eventq.hh. So, OK, let's open eventq.hh. I'm going to search for event function. Oh, what is this? OK. Oh. OK. So as you can see, it has a member called callback, which is the callback for function for that event that it's wrapping around. Uh, there's a name that you can specify, and this is the constructor of an event function wrapper. Again, it takes a function that returns void, takes a void, and it, it takes a string that is the name of the function, the event, basically, that is supposed to be the name of the event. So, since we have declared a member called next hello event for hello some object, let's go ahead and initialize it in hello some object.cc. So, let me cheat again. Maybe went too far. OK. So if you go to slide 20, what I'm doing right now is copying the whole code block in slide 20. Ah. And putting it in hello, like overriding hello some object.cc with it. Oh, maybe not. I'm overriding the constructor function in hellosimobject.cc with it. OK, so again, let's take a look at next hello event. Seems like it's not detecting that we have added that. So we're initializing the next hello event with a callable. Um, if you're familiar with Lambda expression, this is expressions, this is the capture list. So this is what we're exposing from the outside scope into the inside scope. Um, this is the inputs of a function. So since the callable object that are, we're passing to event function wrapper has to take void, this has to remain empty. And then we're calling process next hello event from this. And this has, happens to be the instance of hello some object that has that event. 
And then we're giving it a name. So we're going to use the name method from SimObject to give us the name of our SimObject. And we're going to append next hello event to it. Uh, does that make sense? Any questions specifically about Lambda expressions? Uh, it has to be a callable object. So it could be a function. Yeah. Uh, I did. Yeah. yeah. So basically, what we have done so far is declare an event called uh, next hello event. We have set its uh, callback function to be process next hello event from the hello sim object that owns that event, right? So hello sim object class has an event next hello event. So that means every object of hello sim object will have an object of the next hello event. And that object from next hello event knows to, how to tell simulator to go find the right function to call within all the objects of hello some object in the simulation. So the next thing we need to do is go ahead and uh, define uh, the callback function, which is uh, process next hello event. But let's try to use fatal if here. So let's try to tell the user that num hellos cannot be uh, non-positive. So what I'm doing is I'm copying the second code block in slide 22, and I'm adding it to the top of my constructor function. So second code block of slide 22, top of my constructor function. I'm saying throw a fatal if num hellos that is passed to this object is less or equal to 0. So it has to be at least 1. So now another thing that we want to do is to remember the parameter num hellos. So if you look at the constructor so far, we're not storing that value that per, from the params object in any member of hello some object. So to do that, let's go ahead and add a member to hello some object to store that parameter for us, because it might come in handy in the future. So what I'm doing is copying the first code block that says private int remaining hellos to print by event. Again, this is where you see how I like very long names, very descriptive names as I would like to call them, here. So oh, make sure to copy completely. So int remaining hellos to be hellos to print by event. So now we're going to use parameter num hellos to initialize this member. So let's go ahead and do that. Actually, let's go ahead and define this above because I'm nitpicky. So num, well, I already forgot. So to do this correctly without any typos, I'm going to copy and paste the first code block in slide 22 into sim, hello some object.cc. And I don't know if this is still the case in C++. But the initialization list in your constructor has to match the order of declaration of your members in your class. Um, so if remaining hello to print by event is above next hello event, it should be above uh, next hello event in the initialization list. So be careful with that. You're going to get, like, if I remember correctly, and if it's not it's still the case, you're going to get uh, compilation errors. And to me, at least, they are not immediately obvious that 
that is the issue that is causing them. So, OK. So we have initialized every member that we wanted. Let's go ahead and define that function. That is supposed to be the callback function for next hello event. So what I'm doing right now is copy and paste the whole code block from slide 24. And I'm adding it below the constructor of hello some object in hello some object.cc. OK. So, uh, Alt and Z. OK. Um, I'm having VS Code wrap the text around. There is no new line, it's just the continuation of the other line. Um, there. So pay attention to the line number. So what I'm doing in this function is just print out the tick number. So one function that I'm using here is cur tick, which returns the current time of the simulation. And I'm printing hello from hello sim object colon colon process next hello event. And we're going to see the, like, what prints there when we start simulation. Then. I'm going to like, decrement remaining hellos to print by event. And then if there is any remaining hellos to be printed, I'm going to schedule. This is how I'm telling the simulator for something to happen in the future, 500 ticks into the future. So I'm saying, hello simulator, please schedule next hello event 500 ticks from now. Now being cur tick. So what ends up happening is that at tick 0, this function is going to be called, or at some tick, let's just say. Then what's going to happen is that it's going to schedule itself 500 ticks into the future. It's going to see, do I have any remaining hellos or not? If there are any remaining hellos to be printed, it's going to schedule itself another 500 ticks into the future until we're running, we have run out of uh, hellos to be printed. And again, please notice that I'm initializing remaining hellos to, be, to print by event using that same parameter that I use to print statements in the constructor. OK, so now what, uh, what is left for us to do is actually schedule an event. So we want to schedule an initial event that makes everything happen. So with the current definition, uh, that we have, we cannot start any simulation because there is like no entry point into the simulation. And the startup is kind of like that entry point. So what I'm going to do now is copy the first code block from slide 25, which defines a public virtual function that returns void called startup into hello sim object that I change. OK, I'm going to get rid of this public again. So um, a little bit of personal preference and also like strong advice for yourself, for your benefit, please try to be as descriptive as possible you can with your code. So like nothing bad will happen if you remove, remove the term virtual or overwrite here. But like, it helps you figure out your code better next time you look at it. I know a hello some object doesn't look complicated today, but your GPU some object in the future or AI some object in the future will be very complicated, and you're going to thank yourself. Um, so now I've declared that I'm going to override startup from some object in my hello some object. So now let's go ahead and actually override it. So, OK, so what I'm going to do is copy and paste the whole block from slide 26 into hellosimobject.cc. Again, I, I like to separate certain functions based on context. So I didn't put it right after. Like, I put it in between. Again, find your own style and do it that way. In order might not necessarily be the best way to do it. So I like to separate these 
utility functions from everything that relate to processing events. So startup, I'll put it like at the very top, close to the constructor and close to a bunch of other uh, functions that we'll see. So again, so let's uh, look at the code and what they say. I'm going to panic if startup is called at a tick that is not 0. So by definition, startup is going to be called at tick 0, and I'm going to panic if that's not the case. Right? If I happen to have changed the way Gen5 simulates and that has messed up this assumption, I'm going to remember that, oh, there's something wrong. Right? And then I'm going to also, uh, since we're at tick 0 and no events are scheduled, I'm going to panic if next hello event is scheduled. So if you look at uh, event function wrapper, or maybe event, they have a function called scheduled, which uh, returns true if that event is scheduled, i.e. if there's that event is inside the global event queue. And then if I pass both those checks, I'm going to schedule next hello event for 500 ticks into the future. So I'm going to wait for everyone to ask their questions uh, before we get to compilation. Well, actually, let's start compiling and then go back. Two questions. So let's compile. And hopefully, I haven't forgotten anything. Um, so CD gem 5, scones, build. Uh-oh, no, not this one. Scones build. Ah. Again, let's try to take a look at the code. And this is not necessarily like a good thing or useful thing to do, but it helps us construct some understanding. Um, so we said at tick zero, startup is going to be called, right? In our, in our configuration script, the only sum object we have so far is the hello sum object. Right? Before that, the constructors are called, init is called, all of that. So the simulation is going to be like root, hello, some object, and that's it. And then when startup functions are called, this piece of code is executed. And we check startup happens at tick 0. The thing that's going to happen is next hello event is going to be scheduled for tick 500, because current tick is going to return 0. Right? Inside startup, our tick is going to be 0. Then simulator will see event queue has one event in it that is scheduled for tick 500. We'll say, well, the first event that is going to happen is at tick 500, so I might as well take the time to 500. It'll take the global time to 500, so tick, car tick equals 500 now, and it'll call next hello event arrow process, which will call process next hello event here, which will do all of that. So if I remember num hellos was set to 3, it'll print this statement. Again, not a good way to do it with C out, but it'll print. So the first print we're going to see will be tick colon 500. Right? Then we're going to subtract 1 from remaining hellos to be printed by event. There are two more hellos to be printed, so that if satisfies, next hello event is going to be scheduled for tick 1,000. For tick 1,000, we go into the function. Tick is going to be 1,000. So the second print is tick colon 1,000. Then so on and so forth, until we run out of hellos to say. And so let's go ahead and actually run our configuration script. Uh-oh. Ah, OK. I'm going to have to second. OK. So this basically, again, confirms that prediction that the time moves because we schedule events, right? So events are our method of like, moving time or modeling latency. Uh, we talked about, or we saw examples of uh, adding some objects as children 
of other sim objects, like adding hello as a child of root. But now, what we're going to do is uh, look at um, adding some objects as parameters of other sim objects. So like, let's take a step back and see why this would be useful. So when you're developing like some objects for, to simulate hardware, you want them to be as flexible as possible, right? And uh, you want to be like doing research, try different options, do a design space exploration. So you don't want to design a CPU some object that has a specific uh, branch predictor object inside of it. You want to be able to plug and play I don't know, a tournament branch predictor, an LTAGE branch predictor, and also you want to, I don't know what other kinds of things you can put inside. But like, when it comes to design, like simulating hardware, it's useful to not have your models be uh, very, very hard coded and like rigid. So we want to maximize the flexibility of our model. So. To do this, like to make, uh, exercise this a little bit, what we're going to do is create yet another sim object. Anybody wants to guess the name of the sim object? I have a hello sim object. Now we're going to go create a goodbye sim object. And as its name would suggest, it's going to say goodbye. But it's not going to say goodbye in its constructor. It's not going to say goodbye in its startup. It's not going to have an event. It's just going to have one function that says say goodbye. And we'll see how we can call say goodbye from goodbye object, the, sorry, from hello sim object, from goodbye sim object. Wow. OK. So let's go ahead and declare a new sim object. And I want to challenge you all to not co copy and paste, although I'm going to do it, and like define goodbye sim object in the same sim object declaration file as hello sim object. So open up hello sim object.py and declare a new sim object called uh, goodbye sim object. So G, B, S, and O have to be capitalized, so camel case. But again, make sure that you comply with the slides, like write it on your own, but then check to see if you match it because we don't want to be doing this over and over again and then. Like everybody's going to have slight variations, and then we don't want to be debugging that. So I'm going to challenge you a little bit, but then I'm going to ask you to copy and paste. So let's try to do that. And you know, for the spirit of fairness, I'm going to do it too. So, so let's go ahead. Goodbye, sim object. So again, it's a sim object. Right, we mentioned that type should be the same thing. So I just blindly followed that rule. Like, didn't even bat an eye, just copy and pasted the name of the sim object. So CXX header, let's just put it in the same directory as hello sim object. So I'm going to put it in bootcamp, hello sim object, and then I'm going to Goodbye. How do I write it there? OK. A lot of inconsistencies in my style. I promise on my good day, this is not how I program. Um, CXX class. Term 5 colon colon. Goodbye. Sim object. OK. OK, so we now have declared our sim object at Python. So now what I'm going to do is overwrite all of this with what is on the slides. Um, did, has there anyone, is there anyone who didn't do it, like did find it challenging to define this? We can help them figure this out. It's a good time to make sure we have understood everything from before.
copy and paste the first code block from slide 35 under hello some object. Just going to drip, add it, remove one new line. I think that's exa exactly what it did. So now what I'm also going to do is tell scons, hey, you're going to build a new sim object. So again, let's. So since it's in hello sim object.py, when I want to import it, I'm going to be importing it as from m5.objects.hello sim object import goodbye sim object. Is that clear to everyone? OK. So what I'm going to do is basically copy the second code block from 30, slide 35 and override the sum object definition or declaration line in scon script. So the difference is now in the sum objects list, there's a entry or element called goodbye sum object. Then. Um, Let's go ahead and also define a debug flag for our goodbye some object, because we'll find it useful to have two debug flags. So I'm going to add another debug flag by copying the second code block in slide 36. So debug flag, goodbye example flag. OK, so now. Let's take a step back. Again, some more information about uh, debug flags. Uh, maybe let's not go back to slides. So there's this specific type of flags in Gem5, or debug flags, that are called compound flags, that when, are, that when enabled, they enable a bunch of flags. So like, you can say, I don't want to be typing a long list of flags, so I just group them into one one time, and then I enable that debug flag. So these are compound flag. <laughs> and you can define them by like, uh, calling compound flag inside the scon script. Like you can find it in slide 37. So I'm going to copy and paste um, the code block in slide 37. And now I have a compound flag. You can just, inside C++, treat them as a debug flag. Um, So this means that whenever you enable greet flag, it'll enable both hello example flag and goodbye example flag. OK. So um, now the other thing that we have to do is uh, add goodbye some object, uh, at, like its source file, uh, to scon script. So let's go ahead and actually do that. So I'm copy and pasting the first code block from slide 36 into scon script. So goodbye some object.cc. So we have taken care of everything on the Python side so far. So now let's implement the C++ side. So let's create a new file called, I guess I just want to make sure I don't make a mistake, goodbye underscore sim underscore object.hh. Goodbye underscore sim underscore object dot hh. So the same style as hello sim object. And then to do that, to define my sim object, uh, I'm going to go to slide 41 and copy the whole code block uh, into my dot hh file. So let me bring this here, go to slide 41, and copy the whole code block here. So this should be familiar with, uh, for you right now. Like all we're doing is importing, like including the params of goodbye some object. Again, this is auto-generated. We have to trust scons that it'll create that for us. Uh, we're going to, oh, actually, we're going to add an event for it that says goodbye for us, um, and then we also have to include sim, uh, sorry, sim object and event queue. We're declaring next goodbye event. We're declaring process next goodbye event, uh, which is going to be the callback function for next goodbye event. 
We're declaring the constructor of goodbye some object. And now we also have this public function called say goodbye. So the purpose of this is that we're going to see how Python can pass a pointer to goodbye some object to hello some object through parameters. And then since we have that pointer, this has to be a public function for us to be able to call this function from hello some object, kind of like object-oriented design uh, methods. Um, so let's now also create a new file, .cc. So I, I created the source file for it. And I'm going to copy and paste the whole code block from slide 42. And for some reason, it's always here. Uh -huh. OK, so. Oh, was that? Oh, oh, that was slide 41 that I copied. Make sure to copy slide 42, not 41. OK. So again, what I'm doing here is I'm defining the constructor of goodbye some object. I'm initializing the some object uh, parent class. I'm also initializing next goodbye event by basically setting its callback function to be next goodbye event from goodbye some object. Uh, I'm defining say goodbye. That is a public function that we're going to use in hello some object to call, uh, to schedule an event with goodbye some object. So what we're going to panic about is next goodbye event being scheduled when say goodbye is called. So we're going to use say goodbye to schedule an event but that means that that event shouldn't be scheduled. So that means that we have to panic if that event is already scheduled. And what we're going to do is schedule next goodbye event 500 ticks into the future. And then in next goodbye event, we're going to just dprintf. So if we run without debug flags and add goodbye, we're not going to see anything. Um, like goodbye from goodbye some object, colon, colon, process, next goodbye. So this is what we're going to do. Are we done yet? Yes, no? An answer? No, we're not done yet. We haven't done the main thing we were supposed to do. So we're going to add goodbye some object as a parameter of hello some object. So to do this, it's fairly easy. Like, um, OK, so if you go to slide 43 and copy and paste the first code block under hello some object, so that is what I'm going to do. Go to slide 43, first code block, copy and paste under hello some object. It is not at all different from defining an integer as a parameter of a some object. So it is param.goodbye some object, and then this is the some object that will say goodbye for me. So when we recompile gem5 and look at the param struct, we'll see that there will be a goodbye some object star member in that structure. So are we done? Are we done? No. So we now need to make proper changes in hello some object. OK. so. Let's go ahead and open up hellosimobject.hh. Well, make sure to save your files. Uh, like, don't forget, like I usually do. <clears throat> OK, so the first thing that we need to do is include the header for goodbye some object in the header for hello some object so that we can declare a pointer of goodbye some object in hello some object. Sorry for saying some object too many times. So again, remember include statements have to be alphabetically sorted. So I'm going to 
add it to the top because it starts with a B. Um, so I'm going to include the header file for goodbye some object somehow. OK, I want to caution. There's a typo on the slides. There is no ending quote on the include statement. Make sure to add it manually. So when you're adding the include statement for goodbye some object.hh, there would be a missing quote, add it. Uh, and now what I'm going to do is also define a member of hello some object that is a pointer to a goodbye some object. And I'm going to do it here. So what I did was copy and paste the line that de declares a pointer to goodbye some object in the code, second code block in slide 44 uh, into goodbye hello some object.hh. So basically declaring a member of hello some object that is a pointer to a goodbye object. So now what we need to do is just change something about hello to uh, call into goodbye some object. So the way that I've decided to do it is when hello runs out of hello, hello some object runs out of hello to print, it'll call goodbye and ask it to say goodbye. So what I'm going to do is copy and paste the second code block in slide 45, open up hello some object.cc, override process next hello event with it. So what has changed is I have added this else uh, scope to the if statement. And in the body of the uh, else, I'm calling goodbye object, which is a pointer to a goodbye some object. And I'm calling say goodbye. And what it'll do is say goodbye, goodbye will say goodbye once. So if you remember, we didn't parameterize anything. So I think we should be ready to compile Gem5. Hopefully, there is no typos, but please let me know if I have a typo. Um, also, please make sure you don't have a typo. OK, I'm going to run the same command to compile Gem5. I haven't forgotten to save anything. No, I haven't. So things are changing. Goodbye, example flag is created, greet flag. Hello, some object. OK, so I think that we can go and check the params struct for hello some object. Build no params. Uh oh, I cannot find oh. <laughs> it is running away. Um, now if you see there's a pointer to a goodbye some object as a member in my hello some object params. And I seem to have created a typo. So let's go back and fix it. Oh, yes. No. The typo here. Remaining those. Can anybody spot a typo? Oh. This is not in. Hello. Does anybody see a syntax error? Oh. Sorry, what?
Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Now, thank you. Was it? Is it? Nope. Okay. Thank you. Clear. Okay, so if you made the same mistake as I did, I forgot to initialize good, the pointer to goodbye object in the initialization list for hello some object. So hopefully that is the only mistake that I've made. Nope. Somewhere I missed a params and goodbye. Ah. OK, yes. So again, typo on my slides. Apologies. Params. OK, there's another typo in the declaration of the constructor function for goodbye some object. There's a missing term, params, just append params to goodbye some object um, in the input list for goodbye some object, if that makes any sense. And hopefully, OK, seems like we passed that test. OK, while we're compiling, let's go ahead and in our components, copy and paste second hello, some object example, and call it third example. Again, this is for the sake of us knowing what was the course of action that led to these config scripts, so feel free to not do it. I think it's better that you do it. But again, it's just a recommendation. So 